Richard is going to give us a keynote now, which is looking at where we've got to on some of the key Millennium Development Goals in terms of women and children. Where we've got to, the surprising successes, where have we still not made enough headway, and where are we going to? What's the catch-up we've got to go to? Please send me your questions on the MDGs. We've already got some great ones coming in. Anna, I've clocked your, your question. I'm going to put it to Richard in a minute. So put your hands together for Richard Horton. Thanks very much indeed, Nisha. And um, I'm stepping out of my uh, introducing role for a moment. Aid works. In a report that was published just a few weeks ago about KwaZulu-Natal, the most remarkable discovery was described. Back in 2003, amongst a population where there was a very high HIV incidence, the life expectancy in 2003 was 49 years of age. But just a few years later, by 2011, the life expectancy of that same population had risen to over 60. Just in a few years, the provision of antiretroviral medications funded by you and many other governments through facilities such as the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria is saving lives. And more importantly than just prolonging life, delivering, delivering enormous social value to the population of a country which is, and needs to be even more, a global leader on a desperately important continent of our planet. That is what aid can contribute to human life. There is almost no better example of the impact of your investments in people than the declines we've seen in under five mortality just over the past decade. A decade ago, over 11 million children under five were dying in the world today. And you've already heard the figure of below seven million children dying now. And that is astonishing, although 6.9 million children should not, not be dying, absolutely should not be dying every year, to be able to reduce that number by so many millions over such a short period of time is a stunning success, an example of what human knowledge can bring to the lives of the people we share this planet with. There are 75 countries in the world where over 98% of under five child deaths take place. And despite, despite the success that I've described, sadly for the majority of those countries, they are not going to reach the goals set out in MDG 4 and MDG 5 on child survival and maternal and reproductive health. And I'll mention reproductive health in a moment more. In fact, if you look at the data closely, you will see the effects of a very toxic interaction. In 13 countries of those 75, the total number of under five deaths actually went up last year, not down. In 26 countries, the total number of newborn deaths actually went up, not down. We report in our systems, in our journals, through the United Nations, mortality rates. And if you look at mortality rates, they're going down very nicely. But the intersection between population growth and child mortality is such that we are seeing in too many countries a rise in child deaths. If we believe, as we surely must believe, that every human life is of value, we should not be congratulating ourselves on reducing child mortality. We should be ashamed of ourselves for not living up to our promise that we value every human 
life. Three weeks ago, I visited the Shatila refugee camp, five minutes drive from the Armani and Louis Vuitton stores in the heart of Beirut. You will remember Sabra and Shatila. It was the place where there was a terrible massacre in the early 1980s. The refugee camp may not be on the front lines of our newspapers today, but the camp's still there. Normally, there are about 12,000 residents in Shatila. During the past three or four months, families, mostly women and children, have increased that population from around 12,000 to over 30,000. Now, what is a camp? A camp isn't an open space where you can put infinite numbers of tents. The Shatila camp is a square. It is a fixed piece of land where you cannot grow out. You can only increase the density of that population. I visited a health clinic in Shatila and met one of the doctors and two of the nurses. They go to work every day to deliver care to that population, supported by the United Nations and indeed supported by the governments of Sweden, Norway, and the United Kingdom. I asked, do you have antibiotics? No. Do you have drugs to treat high blood pressure? No. Do you have any medicines? No. They turn up to work, they diligently, I saw the logbook, write in the names of the patients who come, take a note of what the diagnosis is, but they can do nothing because they have no facilities to do anything. I went from that clinic to the home of a Syrian-Palestinian family who had moved into the camp just a week before. A woman, her six children, her husband, her sister, and her father. They had one very, very small room on the ground floor, which cost them around $150 per month. Because the population's gone from 12,000 to 30,000, the rent for property in Shatila refugee camp have skyrocketed. And many people can't afford to live in properties and have to double up or live on the streets. In this room, there are insanitary conditions, grimy bedclothes, mattresses that you and I wouldn't choose to sleep on. She had her six children in old clothes, with no reliable source of food or medicines. And she described her escape from Syria, which was frightening. But was so bad where it was, she was in the Yarmouk refugee camp in Damascus, that things were so bad there that she, as many tens of thousands of others have done, have fleed Syria to go and find safety, safety, in other refugee camps elsewhere. The predicament of women and children in the world that we face today is both chronic and acute. And we have to ask ourselves, while we celebrate many successes, are we really doing enough for that family of a woman, her six children, her husband, and other relatives? Three years ago, Ban Ki-moon recognized an essential truth about global health. And that truth is that we don't keep our promises. We're very good at making promises to ourselves and to one another. But truth is, we're very bad at delivering on those commitments. He did what only a UN Secretary, Secretary General can do in many ways. He provided moral leadership and 
instructed two agencies, one of which was WHO, to come together, led by the governments of Canada and Tanzania, to establish a commission to look at issues around a word that's been mentioned already today, and what I really want to focus on, accountability. Why is it we lie to one another, that we don't deliver on our promises? And this Commission on Information and Accountability reported to try and hold us all in a better framework so that we do stick to what we say we are going to do. And the first results of that work have been coming out over the past 12 months, and they make pretty shocking reading. This is the first report that came out of this group, and I have the privilege with Joy Pumafi from Botswana to co-chair it. And what we're trying to do is something very small, but hopefully a little different. It's trying to bring together two worlds that have run as great rivers in our global community, but have failed to join. The rivers of health and the river of human rights. Because I'm very concerned that in health we don't understand human rights and in human rights they don't understand health. And yet the two worlds have so much to learn from one another, and if we could bring them together, we could achieve a very great deal. What is accountability? What does it mean? It means something actually incredibly simple. Three things. First, it means monitoring. It means measuring progress. Yes, life expectancy, yes, survival, access to treatments. This is good, but it's not enough. It's only the first step in what accountability means. The second thing we need to do, and this is where the scientific and medical communities tend to stop. We see our responsibility only as getting the data. And then it's everybody else's problem. That's not good enough. The next step in accountability is providing a mechanism to review those data as part of a transparent, democratic, political process. It's about getting the public involved in meetings like this to talk about what things we're doing well and what things we're doing less well. And then holding politicians accountable, like we've had here, politicians who we can ask difficult questions and put them on the spot and say, Yes, great, wonderful words, but you could do more, and why aren't you doing more? And then the third part of accountability, which we certainly don't talk about, is remedy. How we act to improve matters. All of us sharing that responsibility for how we act. And when you look at how we're progressing on the health and well-being of women and children, truth is, though there are isolated successes, there are many problems. Many countries, actually, instead of going forwards, are either paralyzed, making no progress, or in some cases, actually going backwards. I already mentioned this morning, and we knew it for women's and children's health last year, that aid commitments for women and children are going down. They're not going up anymore. That peak from a few years ago is past. We have less money for women and children than we have had in recent times. And the commitments that we make to countries, and of course by countries we're talking about real human people here, the commitments that we make are unevenly distributed. We have favorites. We love some countries because we think they are wonderful examples to show to the world about what can be achieved with our money. Other countries are difficult. We prefer not to deal with them. And so they languish in obscurity. But there are people at the end of those political choices that our governments, in our name, choose to make. And there are neglected and marginalized groups who we also don't talk about. We've already heard newborns mentioned. 
But I want to emphasize another group that's particularly important, that tends to get left out of our conversations, and that's adolescent girls. Adolescent girls are in many ways the solution to our future for women and children, as well as being ignored. If we could invest in the education, the health of adolescent girls, we would provide a transformation in the future potential to not just save the lives of women and children, but to achieve the hopes and desires of half of our society. And yet, adolescent girls tend also to be neglected from that world. We also live in a world of silos. And we express it somewhat in this meeting because that's how we do things. We're going to have a session on non-communicable diseases. Very good, I say. Very good. But we need, when we have a session on non-communicable diseases, to talk about how NCDs interact with HIV, how they interact with women, why they're important when you think of a child health agenda. And again, in our world of disciplines and fields in global health, we rarely look for moments of intersection or integration. And that we need to do better. Because if you're a woman in Ghana, in the northern part of Ghana, in Tamil, you don't care about whether it's an NCD or whether it's an obstructed labor. Or whatever. It's a health system that you want to provide for your needs, for your family or yourself. And yet, the way we've organized global health, we pay too little attention to that. We also prefer not to talk about certain issues because they're politically unacceptable. And this is something you and I have to say no more. I was involved in part of the preparation of the Commission on Information and Accountability. And in the working group that I was involved in, as a servant to that working group, gathering information and drafting a report, it was very clear that we had to take a broad view about the importance of reproductive health. And part of reproductive health is safe abortion. Oh, my goodness me. You can't use the A word in global health. So we wrote in a very, very gentle sentence about how a broad approach to reproductive health was necessary and the importance of safe abortion services. And a representative of a government that I won't name, but it's a very large country just south of Canada, <laughs> came up to me before we had the final session of our commission meeting and said, Richard, you can't use that word in your report. You need to take it out. Remember, this was a representative of President Obama's government, a Democrat. So I said, well, I don't understand why you want us to take that word out. Because if you include that word, he said, Congress will have nothing to do with this process whatsoever. And you will kill the entire idea of this work on accountability. We thought and reflected over lunch, and we decided that this was nonsense, and we kept the word abortion in. But since then, in other work that I've seen around women's and children's health through the United Nations, every time the abortion word is used, people get nervous and want to strike it out. Over 40 million women in the world today seek out abortion and unfortunately face the need for an unsafe abortion. Are we saying that those women don't count? Are we saying that they have to be erased and are invisible because one or two governments feel that they can't deal with the word abortion? Actually, it seems so. Any organization that claims that it values every life that doesn't address issues such as abortion is not delivering on its promise, is not delivering on its commitment. And we, as a community, need to say that loud and clear. There is... There is a fear of accountability. People don't like that word. They like to make grand gestures and grand statements, but they don't want somebody to come back in a year's time or two years' time and ask whether they've actually delivered on those. But very briefly, 
we can do it. In work that's soon to be published, you will see that if we scaled up services for children, we could eradicate almost 90% of childhood pneumonia and diarrhea within 20 years. It's within our grasp if only we could translate our knowledge into political action. We need institutions that will deliver on that promise. Helen Clark, who leads UNDP, pointed out just a few months ago, as a former Prime Minister of New Zealand, that many of our global institutions suffer from paralysis and minimal outcomes. So we need to work together to strengthen our institutions, to empower them, to make sure that our governments support them in the way that they need to be supported. Because I want to come back, to finish, to this little girl who was 14 years old in Shatila refugee camp who I met just a few weeks ago. I have a daughter who's 12. And as I held her hand sitting in this room, inevitably I thought of my own daughter. And comparing her life in London with the life of this girl having escaped from one refugee camp and going to another refugee camp. And inevitably, as you would feel, you know that this isn't right. This shouldn't happen. We heard two words this morning, courage and action. And I would add only one more word to that, a word that you and I have to hold hands, join together, and shout from the rooftops here from this conference today. Justice for women and children. Thank you very much. Go back in the center. There are a clamor of questions for you on Twitter. I can't even begin to put them to you. There are so many. You're going to have to start up a, a separate Twitter dialogue and relationship with all these people. huh? But I just want to tell everybody, this, was, this is the coolest one, one I love, from Victoria Linden, who is a medical student somewhere here, who says that if only 10, her, sorry, let me see if I can paraphrase that. If only her lecturers had 10% of the passion and energy that you had. <laughs> Her life would be altogether more fun. <laughs> I learned it And from she would Hans learn an, <laughs> an awful lot more. <laughs> and one, just one of the very many questions that have come in for you, and let me see if I can find it. It's about what can people here do? What can students here do? Yes, here we go, from Anna. How can we who are here today start our own work on getting global health up? on the agenda amongst universities and the leaders around us? A very personal question. Right, so uh, in the United Kingdom, there's a medical students organization called Medicine. You may have something similar here in Sweden, an organization that crosses all universities, all medical schools. And that is a grassroots social movement to change the way we do medical education in our countries. It's remarkable. It has not come from the professors. It's not come from the top. It's come from students. And what we have to do, I say we, I'm not a medical, medical student, but what medical students can do, because it's happening in the UK, is that you join together and you hold those people who control the curriculum accountable and you say, we want courses in global health. We want to have degrees in global health modules provided in our curriculum so that we can do this work, so that when we graduate, we can incorporate it into our professional lives. It's difficult, but it can be done. It's being done slowly in the UK, and you can certainly do it here. It is a social movement that we are seeing taking place, and you are all part of it. One more question. Since he answers so quickly and to the point, <laughs> what can Sweden as a nation do in order to help the people of other countries affect how their country's health budgets are used? Oh my goodness, Sweden, you know, you, I can't give enough praise to the, the, the leadership. So I'm half Norwegian, so this is difficult for me. <laughs> I can't give enough praise to, I am actually married to a Swede. Um, I can't give enough praise to uh, Sweden for its global leadership. You heard from Anders Nordstrom earlier. Um, I think the history of Sweden's development assistance programs 
the individual leadership of people such as Anders in the global community is truly fantastic. And actually, I would say the same about Norway too. Um, I really, and Denmark, I think that the Scandinavian countries have been, to cover all the bases, um, I think that the Scandinavian countries really have shown <laughs> remarkable uh, leadership. But I just want to say a special word about Sweden because you do do something special. We published some work last week looking at European countries and child health. And in the EU15, each year, there are 6,000 deaths amongst children that are preventable. Now, that's a small number compared with these 6.9 million. But it's still 6,000 families who endure a preventable child death. 2,000 of those child deaths are in the United Kingdom, which is the country that has some of the best outcomes for child mortality in the EU15. It's you. You are doing something right as a nation. And what we need to do is to study what you're doing right, because whatever it is, and I'm not sure what it is you're doing, which is so good, there are lessons to learn that are not just relevant for you or relevant for the EU15, but are globally relevant. That's your contribution. Richard, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks.